are very lucky to have with us live in the studios, Kashama Sawant. Kashama Sawant is an economics teacher at Seattle Central Community College. In 2012, she ran for Washington State Legislature in the 43rd District against Democratic incumbent Frank Chop and received 29% of the vote. And she is here to talk about her candidacy for Seattle City Council Position 2, position currently held by Richard Conlon. Kashama, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you for having me, Mike. So start out, let's uh, start and have you tell us a little bit about Socialist Alternative. Socialist Alternative is a nationwide organization of uh, really dedicated and committed activists. We are uh, fighting for social, economic, and political justice all around the United States. We have uh, uh, branches in New York City, in Minneapolis, Boston, you know, of course, in Seattle and uh, other cities in the Northwest. And just to give you an example of uh, the kind of uh, political campaigns we have taken on in the interests of ordinary working people or the working class, uh, you know, basically all the people who are shut out of the mainstream political debate. Uh, we see the uh, we see businesses and we see the political corridors of power completely uh, working in the interests of a big business and the super wealthy. And we are on the other side. We are we are raising a very very important voice in the interests of ordinary working people. And to give you an example of some of the campaigns we've been involved in, in 1999, uh, we were one of the forces that mobilized people for the WTO protests, you know, that really rocked the city of Seattle. And we also carried out a campaign against uh, the presence of military recruiters on high school campuses. And we actually were able to pass, both here and in Minneapolis, a historic uh move by the uh, school board. We had to you know, force the school board to pass the most severe restrictions against military recruiters on campuses in anywhere in the country. Uh, more recently, we have also been uh, one of the forces in Occupy Seattle. We worked with other uh, left groups in order to um, make progress on a lot of uh, issues. And we were we've also been part of uh, uh, a campaign called Occupy Homes M Minnesota. It, where you know they a, a real grassroots movement that has been inspired by Occupy has had amazing success renegotiating loans with these big banks, uh, just just by having a sustained movement of people who are showing up every day uh, to uh, say that you know you you guys are making such uh, obscene profits and you're saying that a low income woman can't have her house. So they've actually had success on four or five such things, and that has actually inspired spin-offs everywhere in the country. And uh, in our very own Seattle, there's a really uh, uh, you know, great group that is community organizing group called SAFE, Stand Against Foreclosure and Eviction, that has been doing similar work. So that's some of the history of our organization. But, I, but as you mentioned, we, you know, we, are, we, are, we are trying hard to mobilize m mass movements for uh, the social justice and for the environment, but also uh, as you mentioned, you know, we also ran a political campaign last year against Frank Chop, and it was an absolutely historic victory for uh, grassroots movements because we won nearly 30 percent of the of the vote, which if you consider the shoestring budget that we had and running against the most powerful uh, legislator in the state, that was a huge step forward for movements everywhere. And I would also like to mention that it was the biggest vote that any um, campaign that is independent of the Democrats on the left was able to win last year. There was even a little bit of a battle. We won't go into it too much, but with you're just trying to get uh, the your group on the ballot there because there wasn't enough room for socialist alternative to be printed there. That's true. And in fact, uh, that came out of sort of uh, bureaucratic arrogance and rep red tapism, you know, uh, from the King County and the uh, Washington Secretary of State. And yeah, as you said, you we, we went to court and successfully challenged their... Uh, their uh, completely undemocratic uh, view that we should not be able to put our party preference on the ballot. And I think that, yeah, that was a huge democratic victory for uh, ordinary people everywhere. All right. So talk about uh, why are you running for Seattle City Council? Well, you know, in many ways, I think uh, our campaign, because it, uh, it w was such a significant step forward last year, we uh, believe strongly that uh, that has to be carried forward. And not only me, but there have to be other left-wing challengers 
everywhere in the state, everywhere in the city, everywhere in this country. And we're hoping that by our campaigns, we will inspire such, uh, such you know, grassroots uh, ventures. But at the same time, uh, I would also say that, you know, we, if you look at uh, Seattle city politics, it's really essentially no different than the points that we were bringing up about state politics last year. It's basically controlled by corporate interests. It's pretty naked if you want to go and look it's, it's a pretty blatant uh, manner in which they control uh, all the political and economic and even social decision making. But if you look at Seattle and compare it to the state, it's in fact even more uh, blatant in the sense that in Seattle, it's uh, the Democratic Party elite establishment that controls the entire city. And that elite establishment is in the pockets of the Downtown Seattle Association, of real estate conglomerates, and other big business. And if you look at the policy making in City Hall, uh, for the most part, it is heavily skewed towards big business and the super wealthy, no different than the state, um, except that they can't blame it on the Republicans here. You know, it is they who are carrying out this big business agenda. And to the extent that uh, some uh, little policy making happens in the interest of ordinary working people, that has to be wrested, that has to be wrenched, you know, from the hands of big business, you know, fighting tooth and nail. And so we're saying, why is it that the whole city council is populated by people who are fighting for biz big, big business? Why don't we have at least one voice that is a genuine voice for ordinary working people? And we think that uh, if, we are, if we win this election, which we, you know, we absolutely intend to run a very, very serious uh, campaign, then that would be a huge step forward for uh, the interests of ordinary people in Seattle. So why focus on uh, Richard Conlin's position? Right. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, Conlin's record, first of all, he's a 16-year incumbent. So uh, I would say that in terms of, you know, giving somebody an opportunity to do something that uh, carry, uh, you know, that really works for ordinary people, I think, you know, 16 years is enough of a time for somebody to have that. But if you look at the specifics, he was the only council member who voted against the really progressive paid sick leave legislation that uh, the other council members uh, were willing to spearhead uh, a year and a half ago. And, you know, they, uh, if you look at his reasoning for not supporting it, he, it's, a, it's, it's left cover, you know, he uses a left language as cover for his real agenda, which is, you know, not to actually push forward uh, legislation that is going to put a cost on big business. You know, when you want to, when you want paid sick leave for ordinary working workers, then somebody has to pay the bill, and it has to be the businesses. And it could have been better. I will be honest with you. It was not uh, exactly what I would, uh, if I was to write it, I would actually make sure that the cost does not fall on small businesses that are themselves struggling to pay the bills, but the cost uh, should fall squarely on the shoulders of uh, uh, big business. And they should subsidize the costs for small businesses. But uh, nonetheless, it was a huge step forward. And, you know, that was an example of a legislation that, you know, it, they didn't write it. The Economic Opportunity Institute, which is, a, you know, a, it's a research organization, but a great fighter for the interests of uh, ordinary people, put it forward. It fell in his lap and he didn't take it. So what kind of representative is he for ordinary people? And then if you look further, he was one of the forces that combined together to essentially kill the monorail. He's in bed with real estate developers. In fact, if you look at his history, he has a long history of smoothing the way for real estate corporations to carry out ventures that are hugely profitable to them, while the space for ordinary people, low income and the middle class gets increasingly squeezed and, you know, forget low income housing, that is obviously dis disappearing, but housing that ordinary middle class people with jobs can afford is disappearing. And uh, very recently, if you look at how he has laid out the red carpet for Vulcan to swoop down and take South Lake Union is a good example of his uh, modus operandi. And, you know, for people who may not know, uh, Vulcan is the giant real estate uh, shark by Paul Allen. And in fact, I noticed that this building is owned by Paul Allen and, and these microphones say Vulcan. So you can see the reach of these real estate, uh, uh, you know, basically predatory animals that are taking over, just devouring the city's real estate, while the rest of us are pushing, being pushed to the fringes of the city. But I will, you know, I have to add that 
Uh, Conlin, unfortunately, is not the exception to the rule. The mayor's office, the city council, and indeed the politics and business of the entire city is controlled by the Democratic Party elite who are systematically carrying out the bidding of big business, you know, like Paul Allen's Vulcan. You know, for decades, the city council has been gifting away major chunks of real estate to those, uh, uh, you know, big business uh, uh, real estate conglomerates. And Richard Conlin has been one of the people who has presided over this corporate giveaway. And I, my question is, he's been there for 16 years. Why should we think that he is going to do any different? All right. So specifically, what talk about uh, programs or focuses you would have if you were elected? Right. And uh, the first point, you know, I think to notice really is something that is written. I mean, a fact that reflects how out of touch most of the city council and most of the city establishment is with what the rest of us need, you know, the 99 percent need uh, is written in big bold letters in the salary they take home every year. You look at the salaries that are for the city councils, they, they are council members, they are 100, uh, near 120,000 for some of them, I think they are greater than that. So these are people who are taking six-figure salaries, and as a matter of fact, uh, if you look up the statistics, you'll find that uh, the salaries for city council members in Seattle is second only to Los Angeles in the entire nation. So this is the second highest salaries. Now, tell me, how can somebody who's taking home $120,000 of a paycheck have any sense of what uh, ordinary Seattleites uh, face in their day-to-day -day living. They're so out of touch. And so uh, the first thing that uh, I want to point out about our campaign is that if I am elected as a representative of the people of the city of Seattle, I will take home only the average worker's wage or less. The average worker's wage, you can, you know, say forty to fifty thousand dollars, but I will most likely take less than that, because I'm I am not in this race to, uh, you know, uh, line my own pockets, but I'm here uh, in order to give a voice for people like me. I am an ordinary working class person myself, and uh, if you um, if you, you know, ask what would what would happen to the rest of the money, the rest of the money would be democratically decided by people who are involved in the campaign uh, to put into social movements and mass movements. You know, we, we, we want to help, we want to do whatever we can to help mass movements get stronger because history shows that that is the real challenge that uh, can um, unseat corporate power in any way. And we need a combined struggle from ordinary people where they're, they are out on the streets in the form of mass movements, but they're also trying to occupy the corridors of power in City Hall, in the state capitol, and, you know, ultimately the White House. And in terms of the other points on our agenda, we are calling for a citywide minimum wage increase to $15 an hour. I think it is high time. I mean, you talk to any economist and look at the cost of living and the way it is soaring in, in the city and what people would need in any realistic sense in order to uh, have a halfway decent standard of living. I think this is something that we need to fight for. And if you look at a lot of uh, uh, information, I mean, you know, a lot of people will tell you oh, that may not work and all that, uh, all those naysayers. But if you uh, look at, uh, I mean, I have some data from the National Employment Law Project, which is an organization that has been working uh, to pass citywide minimum wage increases. Uh, they have been successful in cities like Santa Fe, San Francisco, California, uh, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. So it, we are not charting new territory. This needs to be done in Seattle. We're also calling for a tax on people who are earning incomes over a million dollars in the city and for that money to be used for uh, uh, public education and early learning. We are also... Uh, going to use the campaign to build a really strong voice for a very, very urgent task that lies before us, which is to fight against the coal terminal and the coal trains. This is such an urgent task. I mean, if you look at the projections for, you know, predictions for what will happen if this coal terminal goes through and if the coal trains start flowing through Seattle, uh, this, this is, you know, this is getting us several steps closer to climate catastrophe not to mention the immediate citywide problems that we will see of uh, the uh, uh, proliferation of pollution uh, and 
uh, really uh, horrific respiratory illnesses because of the coal that will be, uh, you know, that will be transported through the city. And, and I'm not sure how many of your listeners uh, know how bad it's going to be. I mean, we're going to have nine trains every day filled with coal flowing to the city if we let this happen. And the, the reality is that if we don't stop this right now, if we let this go through, this will not be the end of the story. It is going to be a slippery slope towards many more coal terminals and coal trains all along the western seaboard of the United States. And we should actually turn around and create a different history where we should put the brakes on the coal trains in Seattle so that it inspires people in other cities to do the same and so that we uh, completely uh, you know, reject this idea of coal. And I think the city council can do a lot. The city council can pass an ordinance uh, against coal trains, even, even just uh, on the basis of public health, they could do that. Yes, they will face challenge from federal authorities, you know, in terms of interstate commerce, you know, because if you look at the way the constitution is written, you know, a lot of it is written uh, with a huge bias towards big business. But I mean, I will say two things about that. Yes, it will be challenging, but the city council can do a lot just to delay and delay and delay and completely derail the process. And in the meanwhile, the city council members should be going out there and inspiring people to join mass movements and to inspire people into carrying out a mass blockade of the coal track. We need fighters for the environment, not people with so-called green resumes who are going to massage the way for corporations. And the only hook that corporations have in, in the coal train issue is that it is supposedly going to create jobs. But if you look at uh, the studies that have been done by community organizations, it's a wash. I mean, the jobs that will be lost are going to be equal or more than the jobs that will be created. But uh, it's, it goes further than that. Further than that, the jobs that will be created are not going to be living wage, unionized jobs that come with security and uh, you know uh, uh, other benefits. They are going to be minimum wage jobs because these coal corporations are cutthroat and they're not here to create jobs, but they're telling you that so that you will you know you will not oppose it. And so our campaign is uh, uh, putting forward an alternative. We're saying that no, we don't need coal for jobs. In fact, we can save the environment do away with uh, these uh, uh, really dreaded respiratory illnesses that lie on the horizon for us and say that we're going to create green, sustainable, living wage, unionized jobs for people. We can do that, but we need political power to do that. And that is why we are running this campaign. We need a voice for ourselves. And so it's very important for us to win. And then the other points we are raising in the campaign are against police brutality and for rent control. If you look at the uh, record of the Seattle Police Department, uh, it, it stretches all the way to the 1930s. If you look at the ra uh, racial profiling and uh, you know daily harassment of uh, people of color, and if you see some of the really more striking acts of violence against uh, uh, people of color, even you know the killing of John T. Williams, you know, why hasn't his perpetrator been, been brought to book? Uh, but also, if you look at the oppression of uh, uh, political movements, all the way from the Black Panthers to the WTO protest to the Occupy movement, the SPD is used uh, by the mayor's office and by the city establishment as uh, a tool of repression against people when they raise their voice against injustice. And our campaign is saying that the SPD needs to be accountable to us people, ordinary people, not uh, the elite and the super wealthy and the Democratic Party establishment. And so this SPD, uh, we're saying that we need a democratically elected citizens oversight committee with full powers, with full jurisdiction over the SPD, uh, and they should be answerable to us, not the mayor's office. So you would be having to challenge the uh, police guild on that, which is a fairly powerful organization. Yes. And, 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 and I think that's a very good point. And I think uh, the way to do that is to reach out to uh, people who have been at the receiving end of brutality uh, from the police and also uh, to reach out to uh, unions, locals, and uh, rank-and-file workers, which we plan to do. You know, we all the points that we're, we are bringing up are directly in the interests of ordinary workers and 
uh, our message is that yeah, we can be successful in this campaign. We can win, but we need your support. And I and for those of uh, people who are up early and listening to your show, I you know I make that appeal. You know, join us, help us to carry out a vigorous and serious campaign, and we can take things from there. How do you define big business? Well, you can you can come up with a lot of technical terms in terms of you know how much profits they make or how much revenues and so on. But in reality, what we're talking about are, uh, you know, giant real estate developers who have, uh, you know, who have uh, millions, if not billions in profits. We're talking about Boeing. We're talking about Amazon.com, Starbucks, Microsoft, and so on, you know, so those are the, you know, and Vulcan, of course, which I've already mentioned. So, the, you know, these are these are big businesses. And there are a lot more that are uh, also big business, but are not that well known, uh, who, you know, who also should be included in the list, you know, but the list is very long. I mean, there. I mean, if you look at if you look at uh, the wealth in Seattle and surrounding areas, there's a huge concentration of wealth. And that comes from the people who are running big businesses. I mean, that's how they get their wealth. You know, the big businesses consolidate such unheard of amounts of wealth by gouging their workers, by gouging consumers in terms of how much rent they're paying. Uh, if you look at the profits of some of the real estate uh, uh, developers, you know, the so-called developers, I don't, I don't consider that development, you know, necessarily, but, uh, they those those uh, humongous profits are coming from charging uh, just skyrocketing rent from people who actually can't afford it. In fact, uh, I don't have it with me right now, but the stranger had a really interesting article just a few days ago in which a building on Madison, you know, in Capitol Hill, just a few blocks from where I live, uh, has been b- bought up uh, by a real estate conglomerate, and they are uh, going to increase rents. 50%, 70%, and for one of the residents, by 92%. That's like doubling of the rent. Who can afford this? You know. So what's happening is that they're you know, building all these high-rises of uh, you know, um, uh, condos that, are, that only a stratosphere of wealthy people are going to be able to afford, and the rest of us are being pushed, as I said, to the fringes of the city. And look at how the city is paving the way for these real estate guys to do it. You know, they if you look at uh, the language of many of the Seattle Council members, you know, they have, like I said, the so-called green resumes. And you'll often hear them talking about density. You'll often hear Richard Conlin talking about density and how we need to we need policy making and land use, especially land use policy making that is geared towards density. And on the face of it, that sounds like a good idea. I mean, if you're an urban planner or environmentalist or, you know, who have those interests or you're an, uh, you're an environmental activist, you might think that's a good idea. But the kind of density they're talking about is building these uh, uh, housing that only the real, the rich people can afford, uh, while low-income housing and below-market-rate housing that ordinary people, middle class and you know, low income and poor people can afford, those housing units are uh, quietly but surely being phased out. And, and at a, at a uh, sh- you know, it's, it's, it's a alarmingly rapid rate. And so what, what, it, what, what purpose does this density serve when the people of Seattle who run, you know, actually run the city, you know, the people who work, the baristas at Starbucks, Starbucks, the workers at Kmart and, uh, you know, in, in other stores at Northgate Mall, all the people who do all the day-to-day nitty-gritty work, folding clothes, serving coffee, teaching school, teaching at schools, you know, uh, the custodial staff at the different uh, office buildings and in universities, where are these people supposed to go? They have to have their own voice. And, and the only way we can create that voice is if we go ourselves and fight for it. So we only have about a little less than five minutes left. So what do you what would you see as your average day if you were elected? Because one gets the impression from listening to your press conference on Wednesday that you're going to be spending more time in the streets than, let's say, down at City Hall crafting legislation. Right. Uh, Yeah, I think that's an important question. I'm uh, glad you asked. So, um, I mean, it's it's a it's a complex thing in the sense that, yes, ultimately, we do need to pass laws or legislation in the interests of 
the constituency that we are representing, you know, that I would be representing as a city council member, which is people like myself and people who are disadvantaged, people who are disenfranchised, uh, people who, who may have the right to vote on paper, but it, but in any other significant way, uh, their interests are not being represented. Uh, uh, about, uh, you know, people uh, who are disabled, the elderly, children and youth, women uh, who are looking for affordable childcare. Uh, we are, uh, you know, the whole idea is to represent the, all the sections of society that are completely shut out by the Democratic Party elite. So to that extent, I think if you uh, if you see how ordinary people have advanced, uh, you know, their own interests in order to, you know, uh, actually carry out humane, what you would call humane legislation, it really, or the only way you can do it is if you take on this battle against uh, big business and the super wealth. It is no use to pretend that, uh, you know, if you sit with them nicely, they will agree with you. Because if, if they had, that would have happened a long time ago. However, the, you know, so, so to that extent, we do need movements. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that you don't have any work at City Hall. Yes, there will have to be a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the actual day-to-day -day work of policy making. And in terms of working with the other council members, if there is a progressive legislation on the table, there is no question that it is in the interest of the people I would represent for me to work to get that passed, to work with the other council members. So, uh, you know, just to use a very recent example that I already mentioned, if there was a legislation like the paid sick leave uh, initiative, yeah, I, you know, there, there are things that I would write differently, but th there's no question that on the balance, it was a huge step forward for ordinary people. Yes, then in that case, uh, I would do, I would, you know, try to move heaven and earth in order to get that passed. But to the extent that the city council members want to surreptitiously advance the agenda of big business? No, I, I would be completely uncompromising on that because the whole point of me running, you know, I'm not a politician, so the whole point of me running is to represent ordinary people. So if I go there and do exactly the same thing that the city council members currently are doing, then the whole purpose is defeated. So we have to understand that, you know, yes, there will be uh, you know, policy making and legis legislative work that needs to be done, but it has to be done in a way that is completely, and I would say dramatically different than the way the city council does. You know, right now, the bulk of the legislation is in the interest of uh, big business and the wealthy, and a little, a, a really, really tiny bit, I would say a grain in the sand, it has to be, you know, wrenched from that for people. That's not what I call, you know, legislation in the interest of ordinary people. No, I would say that, you know, it has to be an all-out uh, you know, courageous battle to represent ordinary people. And that would actually involve uh, connecting with people. And so, I, you know, I mean, I come from, from activism. I'm an activist. So I don't, I don't, if I go into City Hall, I don't have to artificially create that mandate for myself because I come with that mandate. And I don't have to create an appearance of uh, meeting people. That is what I would be doing. I wouldn't be, you know, I'll, I'll tell you very honestly, I'm not going to be playing golf and having dinners with uh, Paul Allen's representatives. I will be sitting in community halls. All right, just about out of time. We're talking with Kashama Sawant. She is a candidate for Seattle City Council position two. How can people find out more about your campaign? Uh, yes, uh, they can go to uh, our website for the campaign, www.votesawant.org. That's V-O-T-E-S-A-W-A-N-T. They can also go to Vote Savant Facebook, or they can uh, look at our uh, uh, national website, socialistalternative.org. And uh, as I said, I, I appeal to people to volunteer for the campaign, work with us, fight with us. All right. Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciate it.